open up in the name of the Queen. England and France were at war. In the old city of London, the call to arms was in the air. Edward thought his name had come up, his call to join the regiment. Open up! Coming, sir. Are you Edward Purcell? I am, sir. And your older sister, is she at home? I'm here, sir. In the doorway stood a man dressed in black with a red crest of Queen Anne on his uniform. It was a yeoman of the guard. I am instructed by Her Majesty's command to bring Edward Purcell of Marsham Street, Westminster, and his sister Frances of the same address, to meet this very evening with the Queen at the Palace of St. James. Meet with the Queen? At this time of night? We'll have to change our clothes. I must put on my best. You won't be needing good clothes where you're going, my dear. Just fetch a warm cloak and come along without delay. As they hurried through the dark streets, Frances tried to keep her footing on the damp cobblestones. What could the Queen want with them? Had they done something wrong? They had no parents to speak up for them, no one to defend them. They walked to the top of their street, past the abbey and the new houses at Queen Anne's Gate. They turned into the palace grounds, went through a courtyard and up a stair, and suddenly, a door opened into the most dazzling room they had ever seen. They were ushered into the Queen's presence chamber of the Palace of St. James, hung with tapestries and lit with a hundred candles. In the crowd of courtiers, they saw someone they knew. It was Mr. Eccles, the royal music master. Francis, Edward, thank goodness you've arrived. How you must be feeling the loss of your dear parents. I miss them sorely. Your father was my closest friend. But now you must prepare yourselves to meet your queen. She has something of great importance to ask of you. Come, sit by the orchestra while we play a fanfare, and when she comes in, don't forget to stand up and do your best bow. Queen Anne swept into the room dressed in red velvet and a collar of snow-white lace. She took a minute to settle herself on the throne. Mr. Eccles approached and bowed deeply. Your Majesty, may I present Edward and Francis Purcell, the son and daughter of the late Henry Purcell, the greatest composer that England has ever known. Edward sings in the choir of your chapel royal, and he pumps air into the bellows of the great organ at Westminster Abbey each Sunday. Frances plays the violin. She's a promising student of Signor Matteo from Italy. She takes her music lessons in Italian. Yes, yes, Mr. Eccles, I know who they are. Frances, Edward, come a little closer. We have a national emergency. England is at war with France over the control of the distant snowy lands of Canada. All communication with France has been cut off, and no French goods may be sent to England. Goodness knows I'm missing my French perfumes and face creams. But there is something more important, something vital to the artistic life of our nation which must be found and brought from France back to England. But it must be done in secret. The French authorities must never know. What is it, Your Majesty? Edward, you're not allowed to speak to the Queen unless she asks you. Yes, yes, quite right, Francis, but never mind. Mr. Eccles, explain the quest. It is a quest for a rundo donax, a plant which grows in the south of France. Its stems are dried and used to make the reeds for oboes and bassoons. Because of the war, we have run out. 
Our musicians are playing on their last reeds. Soon there will be no oboes or bassoons heard in England, for no sound can be made on these instruments without their reeds. Goodness knows, a tiny oboe reed on its own sounds like a fretful duck. But on the end of an oboe, it is something altogether different. A bassoon reed sounds even worse, but on a bassoon it is sublime. And ah, the music your father wrote for these instruments, it cannot be played without a rundo donax. You see, that's it. That's the end of it. Until someone brings back fresh Arundo Dolax to England, these instruments will be silenced. Thank you, Mr. Eccles. Francis and Edward, there are three requirements for those who undertake this quest. They must be small enough to be smuggled, since the only safe way into France is by sailing to Italy and being carried in secret over the mountains into France. There are no roads over that border. Secondly, they must be able to speak Italian and French, as do both of you. And finally, they must be musicians, since musicians will guide their journey. The trip must be made now, because the annual shipment of Arundo Donax will soon be sent to the French orchestra at the King's Palace in Versailles. That is where you must find a package of it to bring home. Our agents are waiting to help you. They will make themselves known to you by playing a secret tune. Listen for a cello playing this tune in Italy. And listen for the same tune on a violin in France. Francis and Edward, you have been deemed the best choice in the realm for this task. If you return safely, you will make it possible for your father's music to be heard once again in England as it was meant to sound. But you will meet grave danger along the way. You are being asked to take a great risk. Will you undertake this quest? I will, Your Majesty, but Francis is a girl. Girls can't go on quests. Your Majesty... I'm a year older than my brother, and I am my parents' daughter. No boy could be more determined than I am to fulfil your quest. Bravely said, my dear, though you did speak to me before you were spoken to. But never mind. A merchant ship is leaving for Venice tonight. You must sail from Greenwich on the next tide. Captain Hawkins, take these young people to your ship. Make sure that they are well fed before they are sent out. Give them a hearty meal and see that they arrive safely in Italy. Farewell and Godspeed.
are you? I can't see in the dark. I'm over here. What's the matter? That meal. Shoulder of mutton, oyster pie, gooseberry trifle, and now these rolling waves. We're on a quest. You can't give in to seasickness at the first sign of a storm. It's all very well for you. You have a stomach of cast iron. I do not. I have a backbone, which is more than I can say for you. Ah! Have we been hit by lightning? When the sea was finally calm, Francis and Edward went up on deck and looked out. In the distance, they saw an enchanted city, which seemed to float on the surface of the water. There were white domes and towers of all shapes and sizes shimmering in the morning light. All across the water were hundreds of boats sea-going vessels like the one they were on, long boats with oars moving smoothly to the beat of a great drum, and small black boats rowed by gondoliers standing in the stern. As they came close to the landing, they saw curved wooden bridges and palaces and churches and two enormous pillars, one with a statue of a man on top the other with a great winged lion. They were arriving in the city of Venice. They climbed the stone steps up to the harbor landing with Italian coins in their pockets and the captain's farewell in their ears. Mind how you go and keep a sharp lookout. Venice is full of spies. Look for an orphanage called La Pieta. It's near the harbor, not far from here. There is someone waiting for you there, but trust only the person who plays the secret tune. Francis and Edward were surrounded by men in black cloaks, women in silk dresses and masks, street musicians and people selling food they'd never seen before, broccoli and ice cream. They asked a gondolier for directions. Dove la pieta, signor? Where is the orphanage called the pieta? I know it well. Come with me and I will take you there. The canals will be the best route. We'll go in my boat. They climbed into the gondola and set off, gliding by the rows of grand houses that came right down to the water. The ride seemed to be taking a long time, and they were going away from the harbor. 
They floated into a secluded canal, and suddenly the gondolier crouched over them. I saw you coming off the English ship. Let me see what's in your pockets. Give me your coins or you'll be sorry. The water here is dark and deep. There's nothing in our pockets. Edward grabbed the oar and pushed it as hard as he could across the chest of the gondolier, making him fall back against the stern. He gave a great heave to the oar in the water and brought the boat alongside the landing. Francis, jump up! Get out and run! left him behind. Do you still have your coins? I didn't ever put them in my pocket. They're in my socks, and they don't feel too good after all that running. I think I'll put them back. It's starting to get dark. Let's look for that ice cream again. Edward, we're on a quest. You still have to eat on a quest. We'd better try to find the Pieta on foot. Let's head back towards the harbour. They walked the narrow streets until they found themselves in front of the great cathedral of San Marco. From there they could see open water, and they headed back towards the shore and turned east. The captain said the Pieta was near the harbor. Maybe it's one of those buildings right on the waterfront. Let's go and look. Edward, it's the secret tomb. Francis ran to the foot of the building. Io sono la violinista inglese. I'm the violinist from England. A girl called down. Pianissimo, quiet. Stay in the shadows. I'll come down. Welcome to the Pieta. It's an orphanage for girls. We're orphans, but we're not both girls. No, but if you can be quiet, I'll sneak you into our chapel. We're having a rehearsal with Signor Vivaldi, our violin teacher. You can listen to our orchestra and then hide there for the night. But how did you know the secret tune? I'll explain everything later. The orchestra's starting now. You have to hide. Be very careful. There are travelers here from all over Europe to hear Signor Vivaldi. They mustn't see you. When they were safe in the dark balcony of the chapel, a group of girls and women came in with a red-haired priest who was carrying a beautiful violin. He began the rehearsal. Double bass alone, please. Oh no, when are you going to learn to practice? Add the cellos and the harpsichord. Let me hear the violas. Motto bene! Let's try it with everyone!
rehearsal was over, their new friend came up to the balcony with bread and cheese and blankets and pillows. You must be so tired and hungry. You can stay up here for the night. No one but me knows that you're here. But how did you know we were coming? Your violin teacher, Signor Matteo, taught my mother when she was young, before he moved away to England. After my mother died and I came here to live and study the cello, Signor Matteo kept in touch with me. About a week ago, I got a message from him. He wrote out the secret tune and told me about your quest. I'm glad you finally come. I've been sitting by the open window playing that stupid tune for days. It's not a stupid tune. Our father wrote that tune. No, no, you're right. It's not stupid. And it may end up saving your lives. I'm just glad you arrived safely, that's all. But how are we going to get from Venice all the way to France? There's a plan all worked out, and it has to do with Turkish carpets. They're all the rage in France. A lot of them were made here in Venezia by Turkish weavers. The carpets are rolled up and carried over the mountains for export into France. There are no roads across the border for horses or carriages. Sometimes those carpets are used to smuggle people, and that's what they're going to try to do with you. You're each thin enough to be in the middle of a big carpet roll without being seen, and there's lots of room at the top for breathing. Two men will be here in the morning to take you to the border crossing at Torino. You'll be hidden in the carpets, carried over the mountain, and set down in a safe place on the other side of the border. The French guards mustn't find you. It could mean your death. Try to get some sleep now. They always leave one candle safely burning in the chapel. It will keep you company in the dark shadows of the night. The next morning, everything happened as planned. They were taken by carriage to the city of Torino, secretly rolled into the middle of two huge carpets and heaved up a mountainside like pieces of baggage. Edward felt the air outside getting colder and colder. Then he felt himself being tilted head down as they began the descent. At last, he was set down with a bump. He didn't hear any voices. And after a while, he decided to try to get out. They were supposed to be dropped off in a safe place. It took him several minutes to burst the strings around the carpet. His arms were stiff from being pinned against his sides for so long, and his legs shook as he tried to stand up. But where was Francis? He seemed to be absolutely alone. Alone except for one person. As he turned in the gathering darkness to go down the last bit of hill, he saw a French soldier staring at him and taking a musket down from off his shoulder. Hey, you, jeune homme, qu'est-ce que tu fais? What are you doing with that carpet? What's your name? Je m'appelle Edward. Let me see your passport. I, I don't have a passport. I, I'm from here. You don't sound as if you're from here. Let's see what's in your pockets. Gold coins from Italy. You must be a smuggler. You come with me. Edward was roughly marched to an encampment where soldiers were sitting around a fire in the dark. Hey, hey, look what I found. I caught this boy at the border with a smuggled carpet. What'll we do with him? A soldier sitting at the fire said, A wagon of prisoners is coming through tonight on its way to the king's palace at Versailles. I'll be on the night watch, and I'll make sure he gets put on it and sent to the galleys. Sent to the galleys? Edward lay down. He thought about Frances. What if she were in horrible danger? As his spirit sank, he listened to the soldiers singing a French song about the Duke of Marlborough, Queen Anne's general in the war. 
They were gloating over how he would come to a bad end in France. The soldier on the night watch played the song on a fiddle. One by one, the soldiers went to their tents for the night. But Edward was too worried to sleep. He tossed and turned, listening to the night watchman playing into the night. The secret tune. Edward sat up and looked at the man. The soldier signaled him to stay quiet. After a few minutes, he spoke to him in a low voice. I'm a soldier now, but when I was your age, I studied the violon in Venice. I've always kept in touch with my friends there. They sent word asking me to help you, and I arranged to have myself posted to the border patrol. Your sister arrived over the border half an hour before you, and luckily I was the one to find her. I've sent her on to Versailles. The annual shipment of Arundo Donax is being sent to the king's oboe players there in the next few days. I've arranged for an extra package to be sent there for you. The palace will be teeming with hundreds of maids and servants, and it will be easy for her to pretend to be one of them. You must leave now and do the same. When you get there, find your sister, find the package, and leave immediately for England. I'll tell them here that I've put you on the prison wagon. When Frances arrived at the gates of the palace at Versailles, she was pushed off a farmer's wagon into a crowd of hundreds of people preparing for a huge celebration. They were testing 1,500 fountains shooting water in the gardens and mechanical whales and crocodiles that belched fireworks. Fifty servants came outside carrying an enormous table shaped like a croissant. Tomorrow they would bring out a hundred kinds of pastries to put on it. She edged towards the palace where there was a huge gallery all made of glass and mirrors along one side overlooking the gardens. She heard someone inside playing the oboe. It wasn't the secret tune, of course. There wasn't anyone here waiting to help them. But if she stayed near the musicians, she might find out something about the Arundo Donax. It should be arriving any time now. She slipped into the room. And then she heard something that made her feel terrible. Music by her father, here in France. She had never felt so far from home. Why had she been so mean to Edward about the quest? What if she never saw him again? She sat in a corner and put her head in her hands. Why so sad, ma petite? Oh, your music just reminded me of someone I knew. The man looked at her closely. I think maybe I know who it is. You know, the first oboe players in England came from France. For two years I lived in London, playing in the orchestra of the great Henri Purcell. I loved his music so much that I always play it to myself when I'm alone. Monsieur Purcell looked a lot like you. Maybe I can play a tune of his that's a little happier to cheer you up. We weren't told we'd hear the secret tune at Versailles. They wouldn't leave you on your own here, my dear. It's much too dangerous. The king is coming back from Paris, and all of these festivities are planned for his arrival tomorrow. There will be special music, and I've told my colleagues that there will be an extra violinist in the orchestra for the day. You'll have to come now and dress as a boy. It's the safest way for you to hide. The Arundo Donax is arriving late tonight, and there's a package for you. 
but I'm not sure where I'll be able to hide it without being seen. I'll have to think of a place where you can pick it up and slip out of the palace grounds to safety. It's important that I not be seen talking to you tomorrow. The king has an eagle eye for spies. I'll be choosing the music for the performance and arranging for the printing of a program. Look in the program for a message from me about the hiding place. Next afternoon, after his journey from the border encampment, Edward stood outside one of the glass doors of the Gallery of Mirrors, listening to a harpsichord. When the piece was over, he slipped into the room, hoping he might find Francis somewhere near the musicians. There was a fanfare for the entry of the orchestra into the great hall. Musicians filed into the room, and there, at the back of the double row of violinists, was Francis, disguised as a boy, shooting him warning looks to stay quiet. He had found Francis, but where would he find the package of Arundo Donax so they could get out of there? The orchestra began to play music for dancing. Edward found a printed program. First, there was a tambourine. played a bourree.
the lure. Finally, they played an entree, music for the entrance of the king. King Louis XIV of France swept into the room dressed in gold silk and bright red stockings. <laughs> Frances was signaling to Edward, pointing with her violin bow at the names of the pieces of music on the program. What was she trying to tell him? Tambourin, air, bourrée, lure, entree, what could it mean? She was pointing to the first letters of the names. T, A, B, L, E, table? Was he supposed to look on a table? Edward didn't see a table in the room, but he had seen a strange crescent-shaped table outside with hundreds of kinds of pastries on it. He slipped out a door and searched up and down the huge table. Nothing but pastries! And for the first time in his life, he was too upset to try one. He looked all along it, and then he checked underneath. Nothing. What would he do now? Was there another clue on the program? What was the name of that harpsichord piece? It was a saraband. The clue wasn't table, it was stable. Edward spent the next quarter hour looking for the building where the famous Versailles horses were kept. His nose led the way to the right place, and he snuck in amongst the dark stalls and began to search. It didn't take him long. Underneath the corner of a bottom shelf, he found a brown paper package full of the dried stems of a rundodonax. He hurried back to the palace to give Francis a signal so that they could leave right away. But when he got to the glass doors, he was horrified to see the commanding figure of the king standing up and pointing directly at Francis. Who is that? I know all of my musicians and I don't recognize you. Stand up, boy, and take off your cap. Frances stood up and took off the cap. Her hair tumbled to her shoulders. Guards, seize this girl and bring her over here. The guards grabbed Frances so roughly that Edward forgot himself and cried out in English. You leave her alone. The king wheeled around. English. English spies? What have you got there? Guards, seize that package. The guards took the package and ripped it open. The king looked at the bamboo-like stems in amazement. 
What is this? Arundo Donax, said Edward. We've come to France to get reed cane for the English oboists who can't play their instruments because of the war. Arundo Donax? Why would you risk your lives for that? Because in England, said Francis, we esteem the oboe. The king turned purple in fury. The English esteem the oboe? The English esteem the oboe? Ye ignorant girl. The French invented the oboe. My own Monsieur Otter played the very first oboe for the very first time for me. The English esteem the oboe. Well, said Francis, if you esteem it so much, why won't you make it possible for our oboists to play their instruments? King Louis the Fourteenth of France was not accustomed to being spoken to before he spoke first. He turned in fury to the guards. Take these two to prison in Paris. Put them in a cell in the Bastille. I will go and write out my instructions to send with you. This letter will seal their fate. Francis and Edward were rushed out of the Hall of Mirrors and their hands were tied tightly together. They were locked in a dark carriage which sat without moving for a long time. Then they lurched forward and bumped along in the dark for what seemed like many hours. The horses came to a sudden stop, and the prisoners were pulled out of the carriage and bundled through the dark. Edward thought he heard the sound of the ocean. Francis, where are we? Are they going to throw us into the sea? No, Edward, no, I'm, I'm sure we're just on our way to prison. But when they were set down, it was not in a prison cell, but in a rocking fishing boat. In the dim light, they saw their guard hand a velvet pouch jingling with coins to a fisherman who stepped into the boat and began to ease away from the shore. Frances realized that Edward was right. She began to cry. Don't cry. That guard just gave me 100 gold coins to take you by night to the English coast. He untied their hands and started to set the sails. They were sick with relief to be alive and to be going back to England. But they despaired to think that they had failed in their quest. It would be humiliating to arrive home empty-handed. They sat in silence while they sailed the 20 miles to England. How could they face the Queen again? When they saw the white cliffs of Dover gleaming in the moonlight, the fisherman prepared to land just long enough to let them out in the shallows so that he could escape back to France before dawn. Au revoir, mes amis. Goodbye and good luck. Oh, just one last thing. They asked me to give you this. It was a brown paper package. They carried it to the shore and opened it on the beach. Inside was a great quantity of Arundo Donax and a letter on thick paper. At the top it had a crown and a sun. It was the crest of the King of France. There were two lines of beautiful handwriting. Le courage. Courage. It is the quality which I most admire. Et le hautbois? The oboe, it is the instrument which I most love. It was signed Louis XIV of France. <laughs>
when they arrived in London, they told all of their adventures to Mr. Eccles. You're overwrought, overtired, said Mr. Eccles. The two of you must sleep for many hours. I will give this package to the wind players so that they can make new reeds, and tomorrow night we will gather at the palace. I want you to choose your favorite piece by your father, and we will play it in your honor. The next night, as they entered the royal presence chamber once again, the queen rose to her feet. Francis and Edward Parcel, you have risked everything for art and for your love of music. The English nation is forever in your debt, and your sovereign thanks you from the bottom of our heart. Now, Mr. Eccles, strike up the music of their choice. And with wonder at everything that had happened to them, Edward and Francis sat down to listen. <laughs> 